Welcome back to Black News Tonight. My next guest comes with an amazing story. It's a story of great resilience and also a searing critique of the U.S. prison system. Dr. Rita Ali had been a successful PR professional, a leading Philadelphia socialite, and a close friend to celebrities like Muhammad Ali. Then, after what she describes as a politicized smear campaign fueled by racism and Islamophobia, Ali was convicted multiple times on virtually the same charges. She details the experience of having survived federal prison not once but three times in her compelling book, Triple Jeopardy, Three Strikes But Not Out. Dr. Ali joins us now to talk about injustice in the criminal legal system, specifically the prison system, as well as her current efforts to help incarcerated women re-enter society. Dr. Rita Ali, thank you so much for joining me on Black News tonight. You have described being hit with guilty verdicts in federal courts as the defining moment of your life. Uh, why? Well, I was about 50, in my mid fifties. Um, and as you have already described, a very successful person in my own right, pretty much could write my own ticket in the boxing world in terms of promotional aspects. Uh, could do pretty much anything I wanted to do in the city, had served as a commissioner. And then out of the blue comes these charges on me. Um, I'm a law-abiding citizen and never ever thought in a million years that anything like that would ever even come near me. I was um, basically shocked and in denial, thought that, okay, well, I'm innocent, so there's no reason for me to take a plea bargain. I'm never going to say I did something that I didn't do. So it was just a very humiliating experience, not one just designed for justice, but designed to actually break me, to destroy the school and hurt all of the students and hurt the Islamic community as well as the community at large for the many people that I had successfully helped with their children going to school and just the different things that I had been done and been doing during the, my life. That, that's my life's work, it's always been about helping people. It's always been about public service, as well as even when I was an entrepreneur, I employed people, I was highly respected, and just never imagined. And admittedly, I was naive to some degree, because I didn't grow up in a poverty situation. I actually grew up somewhat privileged, black privilege at least, and in an affluent neighborhood, never was exposed to a lot of people going in and out of prison and never really thought that innocent people just get drugged through the mud the way that they did me and then go after you to pressure you to lie on people go after you to so, so give break us some context you, you know there, there are a lot of people a, a lot of people don't know your story so you were you you, start, you talked a little bit about your professional life you were also very active in the muslim community very active in the black community can you talk a little bit about that and then what happened what exactly happened well, I was running um, the Sister Clara Muhammad School, which was one of the most prominent Muslim schools in the country at the time. We had upward to yeah. 600 students. And these were not students that came from the most prestigious areas of the city. Some of them had actually been headed for reform school. And we took them and worked with them, had a no-fail policy, tutored them. And many of them have graduated, I would say, way in the 95 percentile, graduated, went to the best universities in the world, not just in, in the States, but to Oxford, to Harvard, Yale, all different types of things, and become doctors and lawyers. And so they're putting back something into the community that they got from the education and from their upbringing and the way that we helped to raise them. So as the wife of the, the, an Islamic cleric, Shamsuddin Ali, I took on running the school for him as the assistant administrator. I received a call from a woman um, who described herself as um, formerly Arlen Inspector's uh, chief of staff or something involved with Arlen Inspector. And she worked for the Philadelphia Community right. College. Former yes, U.S. Senator Arlen Inspector. Yes, Senator, former Senator Arlen Inspector. And many people actually referred to her as the Condoleezza Rice of the Pennsylvania Republican Party. Um, she's pretty well hooked up with uh, the Republican Party. So, but I didn't know that or didn't care about that because she asked if we could rent some classes for adult education classes for, and, and she said that we could have Islam, I'm not, I'm sorry, 
excuse me, Arabic as a second language, English as a second language, citizenship classes, computer classes, and a whole bunch of things that the community at large were very interested in, particularly the classes for immigrants who were trying to get green cards and wanted to get citizenship class. And when you're talking about a Muslim school or a Muslim community where many people want to learn Arabic, so that went over really big. So you asked me if uh, we could get a couple of classes up and running and if they get distributed flyers. And she told me that she wanted to give the school $450 per semester. And I want to emphasize that per semester. And you know from school, you have a spring semester, which is about 16 uh, weeks. The same thing with the spring semester, about another 16 weeks. And then the two summer sessions that are eight weeks apiece. But that would be $450 per classroom for commercial space, which is absolutely very, very low in terms of what you pay for a commercial building space. The community college set up their own computer, I'm sorry, they set up their own um, telephone and office in our school. And so she asked if we okay. could put out some flyers for the school, I mean, for the program. We did. And we had like over a thousand people that attended Juma on Friday, which is the Muslim service. So, so many people signed up. She said, um, do you think that some of your teachers, because I don't have enough teachers to teach all these classes. So you think some of your teachers, I said, well, I'll allow you to talk with the principal. She met with the teachers. She set up everything herself. I signed on only as the landlord. And somehow when the community college came after us, I learned from a newspaper person coming to my house talking about Rita Ali, you stole Six million dollars from the community college. That's how I learned about the indictment. So wow. the press six about it. million dollars. So, yes. so you were accused of stealing six million dollars. You were sent to prison for this. Um, and what did you make of that when you got there? I mean, I, I, obviously you put up a fight. You, you, you were made the scapegoat in your, in your mind, in your estimation, in terms of in terms of the blame. What did you do once you got to prison? Once I got to prison, when you're, when you're getting processed in Lamont, it's it's a day, it's all day process. You're in and out of lines and everything like that. So you're still somewhat in disbelief. It didn't hit me until that night when I laid my head on that pillow and my eyes and my chest started to swell. It just felt like I was claustrophobic. I'm in this room with people who I don't know. They don't know me. I'm away from everyone that I love and everyone who loves me. And so it hit me that it's really, this is really happening. I'm really in prison. And just like that, because I'm such a spiritual person, just like that, it was a voice that came to me. And I'm not talking about an outer voice, but uh, an inner spirit came to me and said, nope, don't do it. Don't give them not one more tear. How you do your time, that's up to you. You have to give them the time. But that's all they have a right to, I mean, that's all, not a right, but that's all they can take. And how you do the time is up to you. And I never shed another tear while I was in there. So I realized that my job while I was in there in Lamont was to stay healthy and to be whatever help that I to other people who came in there and were devastated. Seeing a person die because they just didn't give them the right heart medication. Seeing women beg for just basic needs and have to deal with male, um, male uh, COs. I, I can't understand and never could understand why men were allowed to monitor women, period, and, and why they were allowed to take them into closed rooms where no one can see what's going on. And just the whole prison culture. And I have to say, based on what they, talk, they say about prisons and what I've learned working with women once I uh, started my organization and, and beyond that, is that the federal prison that I was in was a federal prison camp. So it's basically for white collar crime. And so I guess that would be like the lowest level of incarceration where there are no armed guards, wow. no guns, nothing like that. There are 200 women. Well, I was at two different facilities. At Danbury, there were 200 um, women approximately and one CO, and you barely saw the CO, the women did everything. They changed the lights, they, they, they learned electricity. Um, if you're educated like I was, you get an opportunity to teach or to work in the library. You, know, you got all that education, 
you got all that training, you did all that work in the prison, and yet you didn't get paid for it, your labor is exploited, and then as you point out, both in your work and in your book, re-entry becomes a whole other issue, right? Women aren't, be and, or men, but in this case, women aren't being prepared to re-enter society in ways that allow them to be reintegrated as whole citizens. That's why we appreciate the work you're doing, appreciate what you're talking about. And of course, finally, I appreciate your book, Triple Jeopardy. It, I only have about a minute left, but if, if there's one major takeaway from your amazing book, Triple Jeopardy, what is it? Is that what doesn't make you or create you can't break you. And I also would just like to add that when we talk about reforming the prisons, we have to restore people too. If you served your time and you, uh, society should not, nor should the government impose a life sentence on you and put you into a sorority or fraternity that you're ever forever marked as a disgraceful person to society where you can't work, earn a living, um, and just be made whole again in society. So that's the work that I'm doing and I, working with lots of other people that do it too. I didn't reinvent the wheel, but I'm out here every day and we're struggling because it's more than reform. We have to restore people too. Absolutely, everybody. The book is called Three Strikes. Make sure you check it out. Dr. Reed Ali, thank you so much for joining me on Black News tonight. Everybody, be sure to join the conversation. We want to hear from you. Head over to our BNC Instagram and Twitter pages. Let us know how you feel. Also visit our website, bnc.tv and also, don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube page, BNC News, to check out clips from the show.